Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our webinar today, 100 Years of Design and Designers. I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted to be joined by Wilhelm van Rensburg. I'm sure you all know Wilhelm, but he is one of our senior art specialists at Strauss & Company and the head curator. Thank you so much for joining me today, Wilhelm. Much appreciated. And we are delighted uh, to present session two that will take you through the entire session today. Um, of course, we are talking about the October Cape Town auction, which is being held at Brickfield Canvas. For those of you who are in Cape Town, please come through. It is in Woodstock, just off Brickfield Road. And of course, the viewing is on at the moment and runs through till Sunday. So we would be delighted to have you there and of course join us for the actual auction which runs wine starting on Sunday and then the next two sessions on Monday and Tuesday. I just a little introduction about uh, these collections I was really delighted in January February this year, the first of these collections came through. Um, which I'd worked on for about two years and then halfway through the year the second one came through. So what we have here is two major collections and then one uh, smaller collector that came on board and joined. And the biggest selection of the contemporary is from a German collector who was specifically focused on collecting Art Deco as well as mid-century modern and that was reflected in the house that he lived in as well as the interior of the house. Um, it was a really amazing piece of art to walk into. And he was also quite intrigued by the German abstract artists, which we'll get to later. So we're going to run through the session two, starting at the very beginning through to the end. We might, might not be able to cover everything, but certainly we'll give you a really good idea of what's on offer. And we've got a lot to get through. So Wilhelm, I'm going to hand over to you and let you take us away. Okay, thank you, Sophie Louise. When um, the title of this talk uh, was proposed, 100 Years of Design and Designers, I immediately thought of the um, 1951 centenary celebration of the Great Exhibition uh, uh, in, uh, in London. Um, as uh, I think most of you know, the Great Exhibition was a revolution in design, in my mind, the beginning of modern design. Uh, on the left, you're looking at Joseph Paxton's Crystal Palace of 1851, and at the same time, also a revolution in fine art, this time in Paris in 1863 with the Salon de Refuse. Uh, and uh, not so much in the interior, as you can see, the interior very much on the right, uh, the interior very much a new classical building, as opposed to a transformation uh, with glass and steel, as you can see in the days of Paxton's building. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, the, the, um, the great uh, exhibition was instrumental in the foundation of what uh, today is known as, as the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, the, uh, Prince Albert uh, was a great visionary and he immediately um, decided that this should be an international exhibition. The profits of this uh, show then led to the purchase of the land on which the, the current Victoria and Albert Museum is based. Uh, and also many of the objects on exhibition went in there. But today the Victoria and Albert is on a completely different tra trajectory, also a hundred years, if you like, and they are tracing uh, the history of design, a hundred years of design in effect. Uh, uh, what uh, you are looking at are the covers of the various catalogues depicting the different style periods that uh, they, uh, they are, are the exhibitions that are mounted so far and underneath each one uh, just the date there. So as you can see, they started off with the international arts and crafts, mainly referencing uh, the American contribution to that, Art Nouveau, uh, also the dates there, 1819, uh, 1914, Art Deco. And again, all these exhibitions had, uh, uh, had a sort of an international um, a, a, a rich, the Art Deco one for Eastern had a neat chapter on South African uh, Art Deco, and I was uh, quite taken by surprise with some of the examples there. Modernism, many examples of Russian modernism, for instance, Cold War modern, 1945 to 1970, a lot of Eastern European examples, and the last one in the series, uh, Postmodernism, 1970 to 1990, uh, 2011. So Sophie and Louise and I are going to give you another 100 years, and we're going to start off with a selection of Art Deco furniture. Here you're looking at an Andre Frechette uh, Palisander 
cabinet. Interesting for me is uh, the actual design of this. Apart from the pedestal, it's almost as if you can turn or you want to turn this cabinet around, you know, because you have the longer part at the top, uh, a longer part that one would often uh, find at the bottom. So it's quite interesting uh, to see that. Andre Fichette, a famous uh, furniture and interior designer, uh, also a famous teacher, taught at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Nantes, uh, the Ecole Boulay in Paris, uh, the Atelier Julien. Uh, his students were routinely snapped up by the famous Emile uh, Jacques Rollman. Uh, he was an editor, uh, André Fréchette was an editor of his own interior decorating magazine, uh, and he was involved in a lot of installations of salons and um, uh, pavilions and uh, uh, expositions. Um, so uh, the next uh, item then is a René Joubert and Philippe Petit uh, cocktail cabinet. Now, uh, these two formed a partnership in 1924, just before the famous 1925 Art Deco uh, exposition in Paris. Uh, they were famous for uh, the fitting of ocean liners, and they were very fond of uh, warm woods. Um, uh, the palisander, as you can see here, rosewood, walnut, uh, and especially the veneer uh, with very pronounced grains, as you can see here. Uh, and uh, the revolving uh, idea here, I think I can envisage on, uh, on an ocean liner. Um, then we have a couple of uh, oak and upholstered club chairs, uh, a very beautiful there, uh, a, a lacquered faux tortoiseshell and mirror table over here, and two uh, standing lamps, both designed by Jean Prezel. Uh, uh, Jean Prezel, a German-born French glassmaker, goldsmith and designer, and uh, he started uh, his eponymous lighting company in 1923, a company that is still in production today. And the interesting thing for me is because he was a glass uh, a maker, he knew exactly how to manipulate uh, uh, the glass, which I think is quite fascinating in these uh, two standing lamps. Now, take my word for it, one cannot have enough standing lamps in one's uh, house. Uh, I'm sure I, you show me the person who, haven't, uh, uh, who hasn't uh, uh, had difficulty with a dimmer switch in the dining room. You know, I'm not very fond of candles on the dining room table. Uh, and so uh, a standing lamps, I think, would be ideal for me. So do snap them up. Um, um, also, a silver tea set here, designed by Christian uh, Fredingstad. Now, he was a Danish, uh, a Danish sculptor and goldsmith, um, and when he moved to Paris after the First World War, uh, uh, Fernand Leger was his uh, neighbor. Uh, and uh, you can see the, the, the influence of uh, Cubism in his work, and he started working for Christoffel, the company, in, uh, in 1924. Uh, 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 um, also lovely a silver plate for peace tea service over here. And then uh, a Tiffany, a silver pedestal uh, a dish. Now this reminds me very much of the, uh, the famous Revere, uh, a silver uh, dish that is uh, named after Paul Revere, of course. And uh, that bowl is, that silver bowl is currently in, uh, in the Boston Museum of uh, Fine Arts. Now I keep on mentioning Art, uh, Art Deco. Uh, the most, I think the turning point for Art Deco, as you, uh, as you could see from the date state, started around about 1910 uh, up to uh, the late 1930s. But the turning point was certainly this uh, exhibition in, uh, in 1925. You're looking at the poster on the left-hand side and uh, how's that catalog resume? 12 volumes of uh, every object on that, uh, on that exposition. The exposition was a vast affair. It was a little village with various pavilions, French designers, and of course, uh, the rest of the world all joining in. Um, and you're looking at sort of like a, a whole boulevard full of these. And I'm just showing you four examples of uh, the French pavilions there. Uh, the one at the bottom uh, right, uh, is important because in that pavilion, uh, the hotel, the Collection uh, Nier, uh, the one, one of the rooms were furnished by the famous Emile Jacques Roman. Uh, and, um, um, uh, and, and the point I want to make here by showing you all of these is that 
if and when you buy all these uh, lovely examples of Art Deco, you need not go uh, uh, turn it into a museum. Uh, this would be a museum. You can rather do something uh, with your Art Deco uh, uh, furniture uh, as uh, what uh, Stephen uh, Greenberg did in his um, Fifth Avenue apartment uh, in, uh, in New York. Now, just imagine you buying that table I mentioned earlier on. You could position it uh, against the window here, look at the use of color, the deep burgundy there, the pinkish matte there. And when you're behind the desk and you're looking out to the rest of the study, there you can place your wonderful oak armchairs. For instance, I'm sure you want to look at uh, what the rest of uh, uh, his apartment looks like. And there you can place your lovely cabinet. Uh, uh, over there. Uh, and uh, this is the other side of uh, the dining room. And this is uh, from uh, the outside behind those screens that you see uh, over here. Uh, and you can still see the cabinet there. So a fresh look at what you can do with your wonderful um, collection of newly acquired Art Deco furniture. I'm going to stop there and I'm going to hand over to Sophie Louise. Thanks so much, Wilhelm. Um, let's just share my screen quickly and off we go. So I'm going to carry on with Barovier and Torzor. Um, they were well-known uh, lighting company, are a well-known lighting company. They have, in the last few years, recently opened up a showroom in Venice. And here we have Venice. And there you can come to the showroom and have a look at all the lighting inside. Um, these are the examples that we have on offer. Lots 131 and 132, beautiful. They're gold uh, with a flick coming through it. When the light hits them, they just look absolutely stunning. And how would they display? Well, they would look really gorgeous. And I think I'm just going to show you some of the 900 square meters of Barovia and Torzo's latest showroom to give you an idea of how lighting can work in a space. Here we've got this beautiful monochromatic um, look. And here you have the stairwells and then entering the rooms. And it's really a reminder that lighting, although we all know lighting gives an ambience and it gives a mood and it gives a feel, but lighting really can be the standout uh, object in a room. It doesn't have to be the little daisy on the sideboard. It can actually be the focus and central um, attraction of the room. So if you are looking for some stunning 20th to century design lamps, off you go, those will be for you. I'm going to move on to Eero Sarina now. We have the Tulip Makina marble table and model 151 chairs on offer at this auction. And you can't really, or I feel one can't really talk about Saarinen without looking at his background and his parents. Um, quite important because his father, Elias Saarinen, was a great architect. Um, he was born in Finland and at a, from a very early start in his career, he was really um, prolific and well, uh, highly recognized. For example, he did the Finnish Pavilion in Paris at the 1900 World Fair, so quite an achievement. Um, he married, remarried, and with the second wife, he had Eero Saarinen, and he brought the family to your America in 1923. So these are just some of the examples. I mean, he's got a vast, vast uh, uh, spread of work that he produced as an architect, but on the top right, we have the famous Cranbrook um, Arts Academy, of which he was the dean, a very important academy. A lot of um, youngsters who were up and coming came through those doors and were inspired. And then at the bottom left, we have the what is called the Saarinen House and an interior shot. So you've seen Wilhelm's wonderful slides on the Art Deco. This is another one. This is actually quite interesting. It was interesting for me because Eli Saarinen actually created some of these Art Deco pieces. So you have this uh, fantastic exterior, interior, and the furniture. And I suppose that really paved the way for his son to develop that eye. Then his mother was Lodja Saarinen. She was a uh, textile designer, uh, very uh, big into weaving, and she had her studio at the Cranbrook Academy of Art. And the ethos at the academy was that it is not an art school in the ordinary meaning, it is a working place for creative art. And whilst that might seem quite a simple statement, it was actually quite a profound way of thinking for that time. And it actually allowed 
for this openness and creativity to, to flourish. Here we have one example, the two uh, husband and wife team on the right, collaborating on Sermon on the Mount, which is a tapestry which was created in 1941. Um, Elile created the uh, preliminary drawings for it. She had it then woven and she did the final touches after her weavers had actually presented and, and done the tapestry. And here you get a sense of scale. I mean, it's enormous. It's, it's really fabulous. <laughs> this dwarf little person and this massive piece of, of weaving and uh, just incredible. And interesting enough was also put into the church that Elal had actually um, uh, had been the architect on. At um, the Academy of Arts, uh, the young Charles Eames was one of the pupils. And so Eero Saarinen met Eames through, through his father ostensibly or through the academy and a great friendship developed. Um, what they then decided to do was to actually uh, collaborate and work together for the first time. So Saranam himself had been to Paris. He also studied at the Yale School of Architecture. And he then also went and worked for his father who of course had a, um, a very prolific architectural practice. So the Museum of Modern Art in New York decided they were going to host a competition and it was organic design and Charles and Eero entered and it was sponsored and it was the organic design and home furnishings competition. So we have here the interior that the two of them collaborated on and they also submitted a chair and their whole idea of course being organic, this idea of curves, this idea of molding plywood, of molding materials, very innovative for its time and surprise, surprise, they won. So that really set them up in a sense for life. Both of them had fantastic careers in different directions, um, but for Saarinen, it, it really set the bar as it were and set the standard of where he was going to progress to. Of course, as an architect, he had a had an amazing career and he eventually settled in New York. Um, but we can't talk about Saren without mentioning this lady over here. She was uh, Florence Schust, better known as Florence Knoll. And she was a family friend of the Saren and family. And she was actually came to the attention of uh, Eero's father while he was still the um, at Cranbrook Academy of Art. And she herself then had studied at various academies and she was actually quite um, fortunate because she ended up under the tutelage of various or within the tutelage of various well-known designers such as Mies van der Rohe for example. Um, she then went on to marry Hans Knoll who had taken over from his father the famous factory no, no, might be a name out there that you might be familiar with. Anyway, no factory. And um, that was, of course, and still is to this day, uh, and a very important uh, manufacturer of mid-century modern design. She moved with Hans to America. And she was quite, she must have been quite the, the fierce woman, I suppose. She died at 101. So she was quite... Uh, yeah, quite, um, quite a force to be reckoned with, I think. And uh, she developed many of the company's design classics. So on the right, you see her together with Sauron and um, with the, the tulip chair, the model 151. Here she is with her husband. But other designers that she developed as well were, for example, Harry Batoya. So we have an example on the right, the diamond chair. And uh, what she actually did, he was a, a sculptor and she staked him out for two years. He was working in a studio barn um, to see if actually working with these metals, they could um, design a chair that was out of this mesh wire and whether that idea would actually work. And the, the, um, the design came through and one of the examples is the diamond chair. Um, of course, Batoya um, did other designs as well, which should form part of the Knoll classics. So the Tula pedestal group, um, of which we don't, of course, have the whole group on offer, um, was what uh, Saarinen produced for Noel. Florence asked him to create something for, um, for the design company. And at the time, it was quite revolutionary, I suppose, because it only had one pedestal. So you didn't have four, uh, four legs, you didn't have three legs, not two legs, but you had this one pedestal. And in his words, he said it, it um, got rid of all the clutter and all the distraction. And there was this beautiful, clean, simplistic line that you could look at. Um, 
compromise usually comes from a fear of being pure. That was a great quote, I thought. And you could see he was not scared of um, compromising, uh, I mean, of not compromising. He was quite out there and ready to change the world and quite a racy advert on the right hand side to promote the pedestal group. Here we have um, what was one of the first showroom exhibitions. So that's what it would have looked like at the time. And of course, one of the designs and how Sorinen would have put these together, the different dimensions. Noel has great adverts. I love their adverts. They're always quite fun. I thought that they're really out there. And um, this would have been quite um, innovative for its time. And of course, again, the focus being on this organic, this organic look, this um, molding, this looking at the body and the ergonomics of the body and bringing that all together. So he is also known though, of course, for his architecture. On the right, the Gateway Arch of St. Louis, Missouri, then Dallas International Airport. Again, you can see those beautiful curved lines coming through um, throughout his architectural works, especially here at the TWA terminal at JFK Airport. And here we have what it could look like in your space. So there we go. If you are looking to have something fabulous, that's for you. Ferret Rietveld, of course, another important designer, the red blue chair here shown. And we have not one, but two examples on the sale. Very exciting. Um, so Ferret Rietveld was uh, the son of a carpenter. And um, he trained as a carpenter and worked in his father's workshop for, a, for the beginning part of his career. He actually um, opened up his own um, architectural company quite early on in his career in 1918. And he designed the, what was it, the red blue chair at the time in 1917. But his original design, which you can see on the right, was, um, was not in color. It was actually, un, um, it was just in beach. And so quite plain in construction, slightly different to what we have on the left, but nonetheless, pretty much the same chair. He also joined, well, the De Stael group. We can't talk about Gerard Rietveld without mentioning De Stael. And these are two, just to give you an idea of the color use and the graphics that were used, um, two different, uh, one um, Ontario and the other one from um, now the, the Metropolitan Museum adverts for De Stael movement exhibitions. But the stale movement in itself um, was led by or founded by um, some very well-known names in the industry. So uh, one being, of course, Piet Mondrian. And it was a circle of Dutch abstract artists who promoted the style of art, strictly geometry, horizontal lines, vertical lines. And the stale initially was a publication founded in 1917 and Piet Mondrian and Theo van Doesburg were the two proponents of that. Mondrian actually coined the term neoplasticism and what that meant, or in his own words, it's uh, he meant that art should find its expression in the abstraction of form and color, that is to say in the straight line and the clearly defined primary color. So here we have Mondrian in his studio and there are two examples of his artwork at the back to look at and it's in black and white, so I've added in some color slides for you. Piet Mondrian on the right, you can see those clearly defined lines, but from de Lec, his composition on the left. And what you see is the inclusion of diagonal lines, which Mondrian took great offense to. And actually he, um, he left the group at, at, um, at one point because he decided that that wasn't quite going to work for him. 1923, von Doesburg actually mentioned to um, Gerrit Rietveld that he should include the use of a color palette onto the, the Rietveld chair. And so they, or oh, Rietveld took that on board and decided to use um, color. And what we then see is the chair as it is known now, and with the gloss finish, of course. Rietveld also, again, an architect, very well known for that as well. And his most famous uh, architectural work, I suppose you could say, the Schroeder House on the top left, uh, the bottom, a later one, which was the interior from the, from the Van Gogh Museum, a photograph of that there. But the Schroeder House was a very important um, commission for him, um, taken or given to him by Truth Schroeder. 
and uh, she asked him to make the house for her, her and uh, for him, oh, sorry, for her and her family. And uh, together collaborated with Friedfeld on it. She had obviously quite clear ideas on what she what she wanted for her house, and it was groundbreaking. Um, and designed and uh, or completed in 1924. The year before, 1923, Rietveld had actually been asked to, to um, go to the Bauhaus uh, with, from by Walter Gropius and exhibit there as well. But 1924, the Schroeder House is completed. And because it's so groundbreaking for its time, and it still is a World Heritage Site, I've decided to include some slides to show you. Um, what's interesting to note is that the upper level, the, there are no walls apparently, the walls, um, it's sliding partitions. So that allows for a reconfiguration of the room as and when it suits um, suited the owner. So here we have some interior shots. You can see very straight uh, verticals, horizontals. Well, they're always straight, aren't they? Verticals and horizontals as we were. And um, what I quite like is how the exterior is allowed to also come through into the interior through those lovely windows. Those strong, bold colors coming through. You can actually see here the, the back of the, the Rietveld chair. Um, if you look quite closely on your right, um, blues, yellows, reds, blacks, whites, of course, the stale being very much focused on primary colors. He has sideways show, side view, sorry, for the for the Rietveld chair that you can see. And it really fits into that whole geometric um, blocking of color, as it were. Another shot of the staircase. And here we have what appears to be a bedroom in the left-hand corner. And of course, Rietveld, um, being Rietveld, there have been numerous exhibitions and um, awards that were awarded to him during his lifetime as well as afterwards. And um, so he remains one of the, the real greats, um, this one of them being at the Vitra Design Museum, of course, where he is included. How did this spill over and affect if, uh, other global icons? Well, it went over into fashion. I think the bottom left is Yves Saint Laurent. On the catwalk, we've got on the top right, we've got architectural pieces with that block of color coming through. And Villa Mondrian, I don't know if it works for you, it's a, but uh, Vasily Kloeken um, designed that. Very intense bats for the car lovers. He had a car made as well. So if you want to stale, you can have to stale. Um, but we have both chairs on offer for you. Another interesting designer that um, we have is Sori Yanagi, Japanese. Very unusual to have his design on an auction and to the right of him is the, the classic butterfly chair. He was a, a trailblazer in Japan, born in 1915 and to a father called Sweat Sword Yanagi. Um, very important because a little bit like Iro Sorinen that influenced his life quite extensively and his um, output. So Suetso Yanagi was, um, was the founder of the idea of Minge, which was uh, looking at two craftsmen, because it was so prolific, they were normally anonymous, and the idea of using your hands to design things. So very much moving away from Herod Rietveld, who was looking to mass produce, how to get furniture out there, um, and away from this idea of using your hands and the individual coming through, as it were. He was, uh, sorry, Yanagi, um, studied at the Tokyo Arts Academy, and that's where he came into contact with this gentleman called Takehiko Mitsutani. <laughs> Mitsutani had just come back from Germany. He was the first Japanese allowed to study at the Bauhaus, so quite important at the time, and an artworks of what or representation of what he produced. Um, having studied at the Bauhaus. What he brought back with him to his students in, um, in Tokyo was, of course, the Bauhaus ideals and ideas and the work of Le Corbusier. And that was going to become quite an um, influence on Yanagi, who was quite fascinated with this idea of how Corbusier was working. Charlotte Perry, and interestingly enough, went to Japan as well in the 1940s, and Sori Yanagi became her personal assistant, and he actually showed her around, and she became very influenced and, and um, fascinated with this idea of minge and this use of the traditional um, versus the industrial um, machine-made look, and it did influence her work. She came back and did an exhibition, and this is 
I just included this slide because I know Wilhelm will talk about the rest, but um, this is the same chairs you'll see later on, but with the minge attached to it with this textile woven fabric on top. Of course, as most designers, Otsa Yanagi did not only look at furniture, I mean, I'm giving quite a brief overview, but that also that would have spilled over into, for example, teacups and ceramics and, and all sorts. In fact, his father created the teapot, which is still, still in production today. But the problem for Yanagi at the time was how to, he'd come up with this idea of this butterfly wings that he wanted to create and put into this chair, but how to make it work. Um, and he wanted to keep it quite, quite simple, which very much works with the idea of, of the Japanese and simplicity and the Chinese, if you look at all the, the ins and outs of that. So he had seen during World War II, um, or he'd come into contact with Eames's mass produced molded plywood leg splints, which he'd created for injured servicemen. And that idea of using molded plywood took form and shape in his head. So at the time, there wasn't such a thing in Japan. So he went off to a man uh, called Saburo Inoue at the National Institute of Design in Sendai and brought forth this idea. And together they went to Tendo Moko, um, which was the, um, the wood processing company at the time. And they kept refining this idea. And actually on the right hand side, that part of the table is actually a design that Saburo Inoue later on did um, with, into, uh, with Tendo Moko um, using that idea of plywood. So after it was about three years, um, eventually the butterfly chair came into fruition and 1956 it came up on, um, it actually came into being. It was originally um, shown at the Matsuya department store. And 60 years later, they did a uh, revisit of that exhibition and brought the butterfly stool home as it were. So here are just some slides showing the, um, the exhibition. Um, it's a fabulous exhibition. And just the, if you look at how the chair is put together, it's really simple. It's two pieces, one bolt and some nuts. Um, and that's what keeps uh, everything together and supports the weight of a body. So quite a, quite a feat from a design point of view. And if you're thinking about, well, how does this little thing fit into my house? Well, there are two different examples. You can have it in a bathroom or a living room or any other way that you like. The last one I'm going to talk about is just briefly are these two Danish chairs. Um, they are on offer as well. And we I just have to mention them because they work with the whole um, idea of this molded look. Um, they're quite lovely. And the Danes, of course, being important proponents of mid-century modern. So I'm going to now hand over back to Wilhelm. So let me stop sharing my screen. And back to you, Wilhelm. Is that okay? Can you see it? Yes, thank you. Okay, so um, so you've heard Sophie Louise introducing Charles uh, Eames studying with uh, Saarinen, and uh, we're very fortunate to have two sets of his famous um, lounge chair in Ottoman on sale. Um, it was um, uh, produced uh, in uh, 1956 and it was uh, the only chair as far as I know who was honored by a 50-year celebratory exhibition at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York. You're looking at the cover of the catalog there and Roberta Smith, uh, the foremost art critic, uh, had this to say. Charles Eames cited the English club chair as an inspiration and famously said he was after a chair with a warm receptive look of a well-used first basement's mitt. He got that, although it also resembles a beetle flipped on its back. The Eames chair quickly became a post-war status symbol fav favoured by elites, whether captains of industry, college deans, modern art collectors or architects. Uh, this is an exploded view of uh, the chair on that exhibition that I mentioned early on. And uh, the whole idea became quite um, a, a craze in America, taken up by uh, the, uh, the, the advertising agencies, the Mad Men of Madison Avenue. They used it in adverts, for instance, of televisions, of uh, suits that you have uh, over here. Uh, but the women were quick in saying it's not only for the men, it's also for us, as you can see here with this uh, corporate woman over here. 
It was used in films such as Sunday in New York, 1963. There you have a very young Jane Fonda uh, on the lounge chair over there. Uh, and even those of you who remember Frazier, the, the uh, uh, sitcom uh, of the 1990s, he, uh, in his uh, apartment in Seattle, also on the pedestal, uh, together with a the piano, there you have uh, the uh, Eames uh, lounge chair and uh, Ottoman. Uh, Eames himself had uh, um, um, a copy in his own study. He studied, of course, in one of uh, the famous case study houses, 36 designed, most of them built in California. And this is what uh, his study uh, looked like. Um, I think the chair works quite well in a very long uh, room, as you can see over there, and it can articulate the space quite nicely, uh, uh, serving as a sort of a room divider, if you like, uh, between uh, a dining and a sitting area. Um, we also have uh, the surf, uh, surfboard table um, uh, by uh, Charles and uh, his wife, Ray Eames. And again, I mean, it can uh, really uh, fill a space quite nicely uh, with a sort of a floating disc, give, uh, a disc uh, in the middle of uh, the, the room, giving it sort of like almost like an alien effect here. Um, Herman Miller uh, produced many of these and uh, he used this together with uh, uh, the two uh, rockers on the side as uh, one of uh, the covers of uh, his uh, catalog. Uh, we also have uh, on sale the office chair designed by Charles and Ray Eames, and uh, I discovered this contemporary, I suppose, uh, page from a magazine here, distinct, uh, well, giving the readership an idea of how to distinguish between high brow, middle, uh, upper middle brow, lower middle brow, and low brow, and lo and behold, you are in good company if you buy one of those, because you would be very high brow there. Uh, the work featured prominently in a 1946 exhibition, uh, this particular chair, a 1946 exhibition at uh, the Museum of uh, Modern Art, as you can see there. Um, uh, Sophie, we showed you this one. Uh, just beyond the exhibition, you can still see the sculpture park there. I think this has been done away with in the recent renovations at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, but be that as it may. Also a pair of uh, plastic and chrome arm armchairs. I want you to remember that uh, mid-century modern um, furniture is characterized by uh, innovation in uh, uh, technology, in production. Sophie Louise mentioned the plywood, uh, and certainly plywood was used extensively by the Eames's, uh, plastic, steel, uh, and the likes. Ex-servicemen, of course, with a bit of money, wanting a completely different lifestyle. They have wanted their own ap uh, apartments. They had money to spend on furniture. And this is the type of thing that, uh, that uh, they uh, bought. We have uh, the rocker here. And the, again, the rocker was also used in adverts and even in uh, popular culture, such as the Dick Tracy comic strip here, where a group of... Uh, um, a gangsters, I suppose, couldn't decide on which color rocker to buy, yellow, green, red, blue, and there you go. Um, I'm going on to another set of uh, modern furniture, and this time designed by Le Corbusier, uh, Pierre, his cousin Pierre Jeanneret and uh, Charlotte Perriand. And we have uh, on sale the chrome armchair here. We have uh, the chaise lounge and uh, the leather chrome two-seaters, two of them as well as uh, black leather armchairs here. Now, um, Le Corbusier thought about that. He conceptualized that as early, uh, uh, these pieces as early as 1925 uh, in, in one of his uh, uh, writings where he defined three different types of furniture, uh, type needs, type furniture, and human limb objects. I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, his theory that uh, uh, design of any kind, architecture, furniture must be based on uh, the dimension of the human body and human limb objects he defines as extensions of our limbs and adapted to human functions that are type needs and type functions, therefore type objects and type furniture. The human limb object is a docile servant. Listen to this. A good servant is discreet and self-effacing in order to leave his master free. 
certainly works of arts are tools, beautiful tools, and long live the good taste manifested by choice, subtlety, proportion, and harmony. Now, uh, I think that uh, 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 that uh, group of furniture uh, was inspired by a commission they had. Uh, this was the Villa Roche that uh, Le Corbusier designed, uh, furnished on the left in typical Art Deco style. The owners wanted something new, and he and his team, his cousin uh, Pierre and Charlotte Perriard, then said, give it over to us. And this is what they then came up with. You have another view there, and you can see uh, the chaise lounge, the armchair, and uh, 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 the chair here. The, the works also featured prominently in their display rooms, such as you can see there with other examples of uh, Charlotte Perriard's work. Uh, and uh, the Chasse Lounge featured also prominently in Le Corbusier's famous Villa Savoy, as you can see here. Uh, this is another view uh, you can see of the same room. You can see the Chasse Lounge there, the armchair and the other armchair over there. Again, in your house, I think uh, this uh, it would look well, uh, well in a fairly a large uh, uh, room, double volume preferably. Look at the neutral walls, neutral floors, uh, so, uh, so quite beautiful. Uh, the armchair in a contemporary uh, 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 photograph here, and um, uh, Sophie Louise also mentioned the idea of color. These were Le Corbusier's favorite uh, colors. Uh, and those of you who want the definitive book on his furniture, that is the one to buy. I'm showing you the cover on the right hand side. But uh, for these uh, pieces, I would go with Charlotte Perriand's color scheme. This is one of her famous bookshelves. And look how beautiful your, your newly acquired uh, pieces would look like with that type of color scheme. I'm going to stop there and then hand over to Sophie Louise to continue. Okay, super. Thank you, Wilhelm. So I'm going to carry on here with um, Marcel Breuer. So Marcel Breuer, uh, of course, another proponent of or student of the Bauhaus. He studied at the Bauhaus in Germany and graduated in 1924. He went on to teach at the Bauhaus and um, he produced a number of, of works in his time, was very influenced by Le Corbusier, for example, and Mies van der Rohe, both of them being senior, and as well, Helen has shown you, um, Le Corbusier well established by that time and an influential um, character in the design world, as it were. Not 155 is one pair of Vasily chairs that we have on other. This one is very special to me. Um, they are signed on the backrest, and so signed pieces like that very rarely come to auction. So I'm very, very happy to have those. What was Marcel Breuer thinking of? Well, the idea of this molding, as you've seen um, with Le Corbusier as well, this molding of uh, the steel. And um, apparently uh, this came originally also and was influenced by the Adler Fahrrad, which is just a, it's a eagle bicycle, um, the German word for that. And um, Breuer took that idea and created this wonderful chair, which is the, um, the Vasili chair. So we have these geometric lines that are happening, very um, sharp lines, angular lines, when you look at the backrest um, and the way the leather is positioned, and then this a lot of negative space or um, open space with um, ar around the chair. That was cutting edge at the time, and <laughs> Breuer himself was actually said that um, out of all of his work, he thought that this was his most extreme work, both in its outward appearance and in the use of the materials. He said it is the least artistic, the most logical, the least cozy, and the most mechanical. And of course, we are looking back to that use of, um, of machines, of going back to uh, mechanization. You're moving away from the aerosaurinans with this beautiful, organic, um, lovely, cozy look and into this very stark and abstract um, design that came through and and interesting how that then filtered through into his other designs so we have for example the little um, I call them the B tables, B3s, I think they are, um, down here on the right hand side, the Vasili chair in, in, the, in the room setting, and this was actually in the um, Bauhaus, one of these, uh, I think it was the student rooms or the master rooms, one of those rooms had that furniture in them, and we're quite fortunate in that we've got 
examples of each, as well as the Lacchio, which isn't in this photograph, but it's a very low coffee table. But again, that same design coming through and being um, implemented across, across the board. And that concept then being taken through into another design. Here we have, sorry, the outside of the Bauhaus, just in case you're wondering what that looked like, and the into the Seska chair. So the Seska chair here being shown in the Geller House on Long Island. It's a beautiful interior and look how well those chairs fit there and in the corner in case you, <laughs> you're wondering what they really look like. Well, they do actually look like that. Um, but again, that, that use of that tubular steel being molded or, and put into a shape. And again, that use of negative space almost, that, that cane looking seat and back, which you can look through and see through and the body can actually just sit into it and, and go in. But very minimalist in its approach. Um, not, not the most comfortable looking shares, but they actually are quite comfortable. I have sat in one, I must just let you know. Um, so these were produced by um, Thone, they actually have the Thone label underneath. And that's quite interesting also because that ties back into Le Corbusier, for example, because in the, right in the beginning of his career, when he was doing um, his industrial designs and, and interiors, and he hadn't quite gone into furniture yet, um, he used Thone furniture to uh, and incorporate that into those interiors. So what I really love is how all these designers at some point overlap, influence, and um, everything always melds together. You can always, if you're looking for a thread, you can always find a thread that you can take through between all of them. And then of course, Gavina being the other important uh, manufacturer and Gavina was um, bought over by Knoll later on. So the, um, the other little tables have the Gavina label underneath. But Breuer was not only known for his furniture, of course, he was also known as an architect. Um, he started his own studio in New York and uh, worked there and, until his passing. And this is the outside of what was the Whitney Museum of Modern Art and was reopened as the Met Breuer in 2016. And I love the photograph on the right because it's actually the window that you see so prominently on the side here or the front. Um, and if you look on the interior, look at that beautiful geometric view you're getting, really abstract, but, but so engaging in a way and, and an artwork in itself, actually, when you look at it. He was not keen on the natural light coming in. He preferred the fluorescent lights coming. So you have this Art Deco style lighting all the way through, which is quite amazing. It reminds me a little bit of the Baxter Theatre here in Cape Town. And then the sunken sculpture garden. Um, on the bottom level. But again, if you look at those curves, you can see all the designs coming through, but we have to move on. <laughs> and so we have Mies van der Rohe, who was another important proponent um, of uh, and contemporary as well to Le Corbusier at the time, very important um, figure also in terms of influencing Marcel Breuer. And if you look to the chair on the right that he's seated on, you can actually see the Seska chair almost in a way taking shape. Um, so quite interesting to see, to see how the influences come through and the younger designers looking to the more established designers, taking those ideas and transforming them into something that is again, radical and new for that time. And of course, I mean, these designs have stood the testimony of time. On the left-hand side, just an idea, if you're um, wanting to buy Barcelona chairs, we have them for you. If you're wanting a day bed, we have it for you. So here's an idea of what it could look like. You could have all of it and make it look fantastic in your room or house, should I say. So I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to you, Wilhelm. Back over to you. Uh, is, uh, is that okay? Perfect. Yeah, um, Eileen Gray. Um, Irish uh, uh, woman designer, born in uh, 1878. She was also purportedly the first woman uh, to be uh, admitted to the Slade School of Art in 1898. But soon after that, she, um, she moved to Paris, where she uh, lived uh, her whole life. So we have these two uh, wonderful uh, glass and cream tables on the sale, as well as this extended jean table. Um, now this is uh, what uh, what uh, what her look uh, uh, is like. You know, this is where you can put your uh, your table, the daybed there, and a famous screen there. 
uh, and she was also a mean architect. She built this for uh, her and her partner on the French Riviera. And her good friend Le Corbusier was, of course, very jealous because he had not yet built his famous Villa Savoy. And you can see echoes of that as well. This is what the house looks like uh, today. And the black and white photographs are all uh, contemporary uh, furniture of uh, the time. And I'm talking here of uh, 1924. Uh, other views of the house. Uh, and uh, speaking of Le Corbusier, she was very, actually very angry when he did this mural for her. She considered uh, uh, him to be sort of a vandal. She vandalized her wonderful house, as you can see over there. Uh, and then a group of uh, wonderful Charles uh, uh, Rennie Macintosh furniture. Um, uh, Scottish design, uh, well, architect first and foremost, uh, forming a partnership with his uh, three best friends, and then later on furnishing uh, it with uh, these pieces, such as the willow chair that you see over here, uh, another table aligned with Macintosh, but we couldn't find the says now uh, a, a label uh, uh, on it. So, um, uh, we, we think it is by Macintosh, but not quite sure. We have uh, the ladder back chair uh, over there and the piece de resistance, certainly this set of eight black stone chairs and uh, dining table together with, uh, with, uh, with a sideboard. Now these uh, uh, pieces were designed for the Glasgow School of Art. Uh, the, uh, the, those uh, uh, chairs, some people call them the tulip chairs, especially for the conference room uh, of the uh, director, as you can see there, but they also uh, put singly in rooms such as that, uh, also used in uh, installations of uh, exhibitions. The ladder back uh, chair you can see here in a bedroom, the bolting cupboards, uh, and uh, the willow tree specifically designed for the director's office, the director of uh, the Glasgow School of Art over there. Uh, I was intrigued with that sideboard because it reminded me very much of a writing table that you can see in this interior. He of course designed many, uh, well that's a, that's a close up of that writing table, many other uh, uh, writing tables. And I was fascinated by this little detail that you see there. Uh, this is from our uh, sideboard because they, they do come up uh, in, in, in his uh, designs and it was based on his famous watercolor of uh, roses and uh, teardrops, as you can see there. Some people maintain that it was his wife, Margaret MacDonald, who uh, designed it first and foremost, but I think the jury is still out on that. Uh, in terms of color, if you want to uh, choose a complementary color for your very black uh, furniture, uh, 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 Magnetos furniture, I think look at his other watercolors, um, the Lefianthem over here and the Anemones on here, that wonderful purple, the blues, the reds, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and the likes. And next time you are in Glasgow, make sure to visit the Willow uh, Tea Rooms, newly restored, as you can see from uh, these two photographs. Okay, back to you, Sophie Louise. Duper duper. Let me share the screen one last time and off we go. Okay, so here we go. Philippe Stark is next on, on my list. And Philippe Stark is one of those designers. He is very much still with us and alive and well, French designer. Um, and he's been prolific. He is still prolific. Uh, if you're looking for a, for a lemon squeezer, orange squeezer, you've got it. If you're looking for the interior of the Champs uh, Elysee Palace um, that he redid for uh, President Mitterrand, you have it. If you're looking for a yacht, you can go to Stark. If you're looking for a gun lamp, you can go to Stark. Um, it's, it's really, his output is incredible um, and uh, very much in line with technology. He was one of the few who was invited to to the Technology, Entertainment and Design Conference, which included Bill Clinton and Richard Branson. So it gives you an idea of, um, of his output and uh, the type of person he is and where his interests lie. But coming to our sale, Cafe Costas is, a, uh, of course, a very well-known um, chair, and it was designed for the Cafe Costas uh, restaurant in Paris. It was um, and is one of Stark's best-known works. Uh, a very uh, 
huge bistro that is owned by Jean-Louis Costes. And he asked Stark to create um, a cafe chair. And uh, this is the interior that was designed. And very interesting is that it's quite, uh, quite, a, quite a story, but the clock that is at the top of the staircase is um, of course time, representing time. And um, Stark was quite taken with the idea of, as he put it, lovers kissing, but this idea of death being in the background. So yeah, not quite sure um, how to take that, but definitely a lot of thought went into these interiors and how to um, how to put them into uh, into play. And about four thousand people a day go apparently to the cafe costas, so very sought after. And you can sit on a three-legged chair. So we've we've got them all. We've got one leg, we've got two legs, we've got three legs, and we've got four legs. So any legs you want, you can come to us. They are there. Um, so here we have Cafe Costas, lot 136. And um, Costa, I mean, Stark also designed for a lighting company called Floss. Um, so we have some examples, they are not by Stark, but we have some examples of Floss lighting on the sale as well. Um, two on the left, the one is a very um, tubular, they're quite, they're quite lovely actually, very, um, very quiet, very calm, but they work lovely in any setting um, if you're looking to enhance the room mood. And then on the right, uh, we have some carpets. So why do we have these carpets? Well, they belong to uh, the one collector who was quite taken with German abstract artist, Karl Zeus being an exponent of that. And um, he invited Karl Zeus to come to South Africa, stay at his home and create these works. And then it became a collaborative event where these works were then actually printed onto um, onto wool and made into a carpet. And that's where Regalia Design um, Carpet Company came into play. So three different uh, designs, very, very abstract, um, very graphic and uh, very bold colors again coming through there. And then just to finish off for us, we have Matteo Matigo on sale as well, garden furniture. So there we have it. Uh, we did have the Antheo chairs on the I think it was the last sale that did extremely well. So if you missed those, here's another chance to have some Matigo. We've got Charles Pollock, um, which is your office furniture. And then of course, we have the Action Roll Top Desk by Charles Eames uh, with the Herman Miller stamp. And this would have been um, towards the end of when, when the Eameses went into their office furniture um, collection or designing phase. Uh, quite an important piece to have, so delighted to have that. It rolls back and you've got all these little compartments that you can fiddle with and hide things with. And if you leave a mess, you just roll the top over it again and there it looks neat and lovely for your guests to come into your study. And then two lovely little uh, lamps on the side there as well. So that is all from, from us. And I'm going to stop sharing um, my screen. Oh dear, hang on, let's just do this, stop share. So if you are in Cape Town, please come through. The viewing, like I said, is at Brickfield Canvas, which is in Woodstock off Brickfield Road. If you do get stuck, um, just put it into your GPS, you'll find us, I'm sure, or phone us at Strauss and Company, we'll direct you. And uh, the viewing runs till, uh, till Sunday. And then of course, the, these pieces come on auction um, and up for grabs on Monday, the 11th of October. So I'm going to thank you, Wilhelm. It's been a joy working with you. Always a pleasure to have you do these. And um, I think, well, I hope we've entertained, entertained everyone enough. And on that note, I'm going to say goodbye. And thank you very much. And we'll see you all in the morning, maybe. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation, Sophie Louise. It's a pleasure. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, everyone, for joining. Bye-bye.